cross-cultural dialogue is, is critical and frankly has never been more important. I will begin with a few marks on the global strategic competition. And then I will talk a little bit about the political reasons for the need for greater cross-cultural dialogue in the West. I will then examine the philosophical roots of some of the tensions that we see in the West uh, before concluding and taking questions. So uh, let me begin by just simply noting that global strategic competition has never been greater, that the period of uh, simplicity of the Cold War, which uh, came to an end uh, in 1991, the battle between freedom and communism is over. We've seen, obviously, in the last uh, decade if not earlier, the rise of the importance of uh, state and non-state actors on the global scene. Uh, this is up the stakes for public diplomacy since individuals in remote locations, whether it be in caves in Afghanistan or parking lots in Lebanon or Iraq, can come to have an influence on uh, the global policy discussion without uh, much uh, need for a significant army behind them. And we've also seen at the same time the rise of repressive regimes that increasingly use democratic language and become much more subtle, including the use of democratic media to confuse uh, people and to push their policy goals on the world stage uh, with the help of uh, high budget uh, strategic communications firms. On top of this, obviously, we see significant uh, tensions between East and West, uh, in some areas, obviously, between Islam and the West significant uh, differences in approach, in thought, and the like. But in the midst of all of this, and in the midst of these many changing uh, and, and a very dynamic atmosphere in the world of public affairs, I thought I would focus today on the complex differences between Europe and the United States. Uh, and my topic is, uh, so close yet so far, the need for cultural diplomacy with Western Europe. Now this might seem somewhat paradoxical given all that is going on around the globe and, and the fact that so many of you come from, from such far away places and from cultures that radically differ from what we have in the United States. But I think it's, it's important to focus on this. First and first and foremost, I will focus on the policy reasons why this is important before I turn to the philosophical underpinnings of the disputes that we've seen. Now, as we all know, 10 years ago, the launch of a second US-led war against Saddam Hussein exposed intranato differences of temperament and philosophy in unusually sharp relief. And so stark was the divergence of opinion and perspective on either side of the Atlantic that analyst Robert Kagan, in a justly celebrated uh, essay in a subsequent book, was moved to declare that Europe and the United States had come to inhabit two separate planets entirely. Americans, he noted, were still from Mars. Uh, suggesting that in the United States we maintained a traditional approach on the use, the real and the potential use of force in international affairs and force projection. Europeans, Kagan argued, were instead from Venus and that their le leaders were moving away from uh, the use of force into a self-contained world of laws and rules and transnational negotiation and cooperation in the European Union. It was a very striking metaphor and uh, I think that Kagan's masterful description of intricacies on both sides of the Atlantic uh, continues to influence how policymakers on both sides view each other. But I think that even within the broad context of Kagan's widely celebrated uh, descriptions of both sides of the Atlantic, things have shifted some, somewhat. Uh, President Barack Obama, you can argue, offered quite a contrast in, in many ways to President uh, George W. Bush. He, in fact, seems to have been a president who was frankly not, as Kagan would have described him, from Mars. That's to say, his foreign and defense policies, by and large, though there, there, are, career, there are a few exceptions, uh, the troop drawdowns in Iraq and Afghanistan, attempts at diplomatic engagement with Iran, and so forth, have been guided by concerns that would have been described as European by Kagan. A presumptive skepticism about military power and an instinctive preference for multilateralism and diplomacy in its place. Uh, well, the president, when he was elected, initially declared that he was coming in to uh, bring about some balance and some partnership in transatlantic relations, but I think what's actually happened has gone well beyond that. Uh, of course, President Obama offered his famous uh, campaign appearance, his famous campaign appearance in Berlin 
in uh, July of 2008 when he uh, addressed a huge crowd at the uh, Brandenburg Gate. And in that speech, the president declared that America, or the then senator from Illinois declared that America cannot turn itself inward uh, at this point in global affairs. But I actually think that uh, we have done precisely that under his presidency. Uh, and nowadays, as you look at international affairs, it is almost always uh, the Europeans, particularly the French and the Brits, who have been goading the uh, Obama administration into taking a more active stance on the world stage. First and foremost, obviously, with regard to the humanitarian intervention in Libya against Muammar Gaddafi. And then secondly, in the failed attempt to try to enlist uh, the United States uh, uh, in an effort to arm in a significant way, the anti-government resistance in Syria. It was the Europeans, President Sarkozy at first, and now his successor, President Hollande, who have been lobbying the U.S. Congress for tougher sanctions against Tehran, against uh, the administration's desires. And we see Europeans, most notably Sarkozy's successor, Hollande, uh, who have been making tough decisions about troop deployments in places like Mali, more or less on their own. Uh, now, the president's advisors like to talk about uh, uh, themselves as leading from behind, uh, but there has actually been significant frustration behind closed doors when you speak to policymakers in London and Paris and elsewhere who have been distressed about uh, what they would term a growing American unilateralism, which of course was the great term that was bandied about by the critics of the, the Bush administration um, and was the... Uh, the American tendency that, that President Obama promised himself most notably to reverse. I think the, the policy case is quite well known to all who follow international affairs. The first great shock came in Warsaw and Prague when the Polish and the Czech governments got only a few hours notice that Washington had decided to cancel a painfully negotiated missile defense system that was irritating Moscow. The next uh, big shock came in December 2009 when the president offered his uh, speech on Afghanistan uh, uh, policy going forward in which he announced significant coalition manpower and scheduling commitments about which the Europeans themselves had only been nominally consulted. Of course, we later saw the president uh, deciding in 2010 without advance warning to the Europeans who learned about it in the press that he was gonna skip the US-EU summit in Madrid that year. And last but not least, we've seen the revelations about the National Security uh, Agency's um, activities uh, that, uh, in, in, in the aftermath of the uh, Snowden affair. Now, all of this means that the Atlantic Alliance today remains as fissured as ever, but I think actually for new and different reasons than they were under uh, in the past decade. Today, Europeans don't really complain so much about being bullied by the White House as they do, as they offer a sense that they really feel kind of ignored, they feel alienated from what's going on in Washington, and that there's a sense that, at least in, uh, that, that Europe is just simply not a major priority for the United States anymore. And I'll, I'll note there's one notable exception, and that's the, uh, the TTIP, the trade agreement between Europe and the United States, which was greeted uh, with great excitement in Brussels, though I think we're in for a very long period of negotiation over, over TTIP. So, uh, and I think this is, this is particularly important because there are isolationist tendencies in both political parties, both on the right and on the left. Uh, and so I think that the distance between Europe and the United States is, 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 is undoubtedly going to increase in the, in the coming years. Europe obviously is turning inward, focusing on the, the Euro crisis and uh, the need to build up the European uh, External Affairs Service. We in Washington obviously are focused more on budgetary matters, uh, the implementation of health care reform, uh, the uh, fiscal crisis that's racking the country and is also hitting us at the state level. The problem is, though, that the rest of the non-Western world, and particularly our strategic competitors, are paying close attention to our lack of attention to each other in Europe and the United States. And uh, they are eagerly anticipating an international playing field in which uh, vigorous, coherent NATO responses to various policy crises no longer need be assumed. So, I th so we, we face this, this major policy challenge, which is one major reason why we need to have greater, cult greater cross-cultural understanding, greater cross-cultural diplomacy. 
And I'd argue that the roots of the problem we face are actually far deeper, and they go well beyond politics, well beyond individual leaders, and they really stem from uh, philosophical roots within the Western tradition, within, Western, within European culture. And here I would make a distinction between America and Great Britain and continental Europe. America and Great Britain, after all, have governments that embody the political philosophy of John Locke, the uh, great 17th century uh, founder of political liberalism, the man whose uh, two treatises on government written in the early 1680s provided a framework for England's glorious revolution of 1688 and for America's uh, revolution of 1776. Now Locke's philosophy begins with natural rights, including the right, particularly the right to property. Now the idea of property for Locke begins with our bodies. We have property in our own bodies, but it extends to include our life, our liberty, and our estate. Because the enjoyment of our property, Locke argues, is unsure in what he terms the pre-political state of nature, man comes to, to create civil society. Civil society establishes government to protect individual rights, first and foremost of which are the rights to enjoy our property, including our bodies, and to direct our, our, our own activities. According to Locke, our property serves as an early warning system. If our property or our bodies are threatened by government, if our property is threatened by government, our bodies may be next. And for this reason, Locke argues, government must be limited because we cannot rationally consent to absolute monarchy. We are, after all, as he notes, better off in the state of nature than under an absolute monarchy. At least in the state of nature, where there's war of all against all, each of us has the right to defend himself or herself rather than being subject to one sovereign who can use all available force against us. So in short, in the Anglo-American tradition, Attachment to property leads people to consent to be governed, and consent leads to limited government, because we cannot consent to unlimited government since that would harm ourselves. Limited government protects individuals by protecting their property while leaving us free to care for it. Now Locke's philosophy, Locke's classical political philosophy, never really took hold on the European continent. There are many, many reasons for this, but a principal one was the French Revolution and the ideas which inspired it, uh, uh, most particularly those of the 18th century French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Much of Rousseau's political philosophy is a critique of Locke's limited government philosophy, and this argument, I think, still has important reverberations today in Paris, in Brussels, in Berlin, and beyond on the continent. Now, Rousseau attacks limited government liberalism. He argues that liberalism divides man by focusing on self-interest, individual rights, and property, which can only be enjoyed by individuals. And that a focus on self-interest cannot, he argues, provide a basis for community, because no individual is willing to sacrifice themselves for the common good based simply on rational calculation. You have no reason to, to, to sacrifice yourself for the sake of someone else's property. And Rousseau instead argues that society requires a transformation of men and women. It, it demands truly hard work to establish citizens' full dedication to the common good and requires a subordination of the individual in every single way to the whole. Now Rousseau tries to resolve the conflict between the individual and the state, between self-interest and duty, by creating some kind of selfless attachment to the common good. This social contract, as he calls it, requires, the social contract, as he calls it, requires the negation of the individual and a negation of the particular in favor of the social. So Locke puts emphasis on the individual as the basis of government. Rousseau puts emphasis on the social as the basis of government. So while Locke uses a minimal state to protect the individual and the particular, Rousseau attempts to create a selfless attachment to the common good because of a thoroughgoing distrust of individual concerns, including private property. Now, Rousseau has a far grander vision of what the state should accomplish compared to Locke, it's fair to say. And, and, and Rousseau, I think, sees a moral dignity in political life that 
goes beyond what Locke sees. But the kind of dramatic transformation that Rousseau seeks to affect seems to me nearly impossible. And he, he tries to achieve it through this vague metaphysical concept called the general will, which those of you who took philosophy 101 probably remember. Uh, to overcome the tension between uh, individual interests and the will of the community, Rousseau argues instead for the creation of a new kind of individual, a person whose private will will seek only the common good, what Rousseau calls the objective public will, a will that is free from our subjective selves and our personal interests. So Rousseau seeks this new kind of individual who will only seek the common good, whose private interest is the common good. And, and so Rousseau's philosophy involves trying to make the community embody this notion by shaping the mores of citizens essentially so that they deny their own self-interest, that which Locke and also the American founders think is most important in the name of community. Now, the, the notion of the objective public will has had deep repercussions on continental political philosophy for the past two centuries, beginning, of course, with the, direct, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, issued in 1789 in the Revolution in France, which echoes Rousseau's famous formula, insisting that all sovereignty is found essentially in the nation, and that law is the expression of the general will. America's Declaration of Independence, of course, by contrast, does not speak of the general will at all, concentrating instead in Lockean terms on how to limit government so as to protect the pre-existing rights of citizens, rather than laying down new standards of civic participation. The American revolutionaries, of course, protested in the name of existing limits to governmental authority in the Declaration of Independence, citing a long train of abuses and usurpations by King George III, and the Constitution, written shortly thereafter, placed very strict limits on the federal government. In the American system of government, individual rights are protected against legislative authority, most notably by judicial review, by the, in particular by the Supreme Court, not too far away from here. Now, under the French constitutional system and under European constitutional systems, Republican governments often decline to establish judicial checks on the other branches of government, and they do so for very Rousseauian reasons, which is the notion that the state, as a, as a reflection of the general will, requires unity and unity in action. And so, even at times in this European model, uh, in which uh, policy admini is administered, uh, Disputes about administering policy are sometimes viewed as disruptions of the moral liberty achieved through unity, since even disputes about administration imply division. And so through this line of thinking, the political administration and even government bureaucrats come to be seen as the embodiment somehow of the objective public will, the general will. And the public is, has been taught to see them as standing above self-interest. Now, in the Lockean system and the Anglo-American way of thinking, of course, self-interest is the very basis of government. So, in France, particularly ever since the revolution, uh, bureaucrats fonctionnaires have not been expected to be responsive to the people or even to be representative of them, but to stand somehow above them. And I think uh, as you, uh, this, is a, this is a very deep contrast between the Anglo-American understanding of the rule of law the French system of administrative law and systems of administrative law on the continent, which often spring from, from the Napoleonic Code. In England and America, all citizens of whatever rank are subject to laws and jurisdictions of ordinary tribunals, and officials must answer if they violate the rights of private citizens. In France, however, the government and every servant of government is considered representative of the nation, and these individuals possess a large body of special rights, prerogatives, and privileges over ordinary citizens. Uh, in fact, under this system, individual rights are sometimes viewed as subjective and opposed to state sovereignty. Now, this distinction uh, in the way that we see individual and society has often been at the heart of key political battles, not simply between the Anglo-Americans and the continent, but also on the continent, and the, uh, with the belief that only the state itself can resolve these battles. The German philosophers such as Kant and Hegel built upon Rousseau's philosophy, universalizing his concept of an objective public will that supersedes individual interests. 
Hegel argued that, that only the state bureaucracy is free from the selfish preoccupations that afflict the rest of society. And because bureaucrats are above politics, uh, he thought they should have a specially guarded position and a guiding influence in legislative deliberation. Uh, and we obviously see this, these concepts carried to further extremes uh, under Marx, uh, and in, under Marxist ideas of uh, the general will of mankind, the, the proletariat uh, being the embodiment of it, justifying uh, dictatorship. Now, but on the smaller scale in which we see the tensions uh, between the Anglo-American and the uh, continental approach today, I think it's key to understanding the role the technocrats play in Brussels. Popular uh, acceptance of these uh, ideas stemming from Rousseau, transmogrified through Kant and Hegel, uh, have led to recent calls or to calls over the last few decades in Germany and in Europe to establish objective bureaucratic expertise that can embody an objective public will in a way that stands above individual interests. And this notion of the objective individual will, though, I think is, is now in crisis today in Europe and is one of the main reasons for what is called today the democracy deficit in the European Union. The European Union's bureaucratic system of administration has tended to ignore the role that spirited representation of private interests plays in defending liberty in the American and British systems and can be incompatible with civil liberty and self-government. Self uh, it can also obviously be incompatible with uh, the attempt uh, to, to, with the free market as well. Uh, and I think we've, we've seen uh, some of this in the, in the imposition, the creation of the euro, the imposition of the euro, which was an embodiment, I think, in, in so many ways of this, uh, of this general will, of the notion that you had to go out and create a, uh, an economic union before you could create a political union, even though there wasn't a massive public outcry to, to do this, and that it was something that was handled by uh, Helmut Kohl, by uh, François Mitterrand, and by a small number of uh, individuals who, who did not actively and regularly consult uh, and ask for uh, the full support of their people uh, or really engage a discussion on the question of self-interest on these matters. Uh, and I think that, uh, but I think we're now beginning to see a little bit of a reaction now in Europe, a significant reaction, more than a little bit, uh, to the notion, to, to the role that unelected bureaucrats have played. Uh, as the Euro crisis uh, gets larger, we're seeing more of an attempt uh, in Europe uh, to express individual interests uh, and to challenge uh, what some have called the march of history towards ever greater unity. Uh, but uh, the problem is that many of the reactions that we have seen have come outside the mainstream political parties. They've been expressed uh, either on the extreme left or the extreme right uh, because the way that the European uh, political systems have been structured have not until now allowed for fullest uh, channeling of these energies through mainstream uh, political parties. Uh, this is a challenge for Europe. It will be a, a challenge for the United States uh, dealing with the challenge that Europe faces going forward. So in short, I'd say looking at the two different systems, the Rousseauian system of the general will, the Lockean system of defense of individual rights and particular interests, uh, sows seeds of division even among close allies. And I think we can expect further divisions going forward. This means that uh, as a result, we, we need cross-cultural diplomacy to come to a better understanding of the shortcomings uh, our political leaders uh, have and of the uh, shortcomings uh, that systems may have. I would say this uh, in conclusion that uh, a, a when I was a, when I was a I studied as a, as a student in uh, both French and uh, German universities, uh, but it's, it's striking today when I talk to younger people, Europe is no longer a model uh, for, for American uh, college students. There are far more Europeans today studying in American universities or in Canadian universities than the reverse. It's quite striking if you, there are more, there are more French students now studying in uh, Quebec than there are Quebecois studying in, uh, in, in France, which is, to me is extraordinary uh, news. Uh, France is just no longer the great model that it once was. Uh, there are far more people in the United States. German is being dropped as a, as a, as a, as a, as a language in, in many American high schools. Arabic, Chinese are being introduced. Um, 
I mean, this obviously has some, there are, there, there are reasons to study other languages. Obviously, there's been a huge expansion in speaking of Spanish in the United States, but that's not because of fascination with Europe. Uh, and so, in short, we have significant uh, philosophical differences between us and the continental Europeans. We were held together artificially during the Cold War by the, by the unique nature of the challenge we face. Uh, I think we're going to be in for some rocky times going forward, uh, and so the need for cross-cultural dialogue, cross-cultural exchange is, is all the more needed among close friends uh, who have gotten out of the habit of talking to each other. So on that note, let me conclude, and thank you, and see if there are questions.